what, what I'm going to hopefully do today, it's hopefully going to be very practical, but what I wanted to do was to set the ground for what Psyche is going to do later. So put it in a spiritual and cultural perspective. And the spiritual perspective, if we take the Islamic understanding, is that we're all, all, all human beings are created from two parts, or there's two parts to them. The one is the spiritual, the ruh, the spirit, and the jism, the body. And the best way to understand it is as we're coming towards the hajj now, we all know that physically you need to go to a place called Mecca, you need to do all these physical actions, and one of the things you might need to, or you need to do is to slaughter an animal. But Allah says, لا he says that actually the meat doesn't reach him, nor does the blood, but it's the righteousness. So in other words, there's a physical element of the Hajj, which is all of these, these physical acts, but there's also a spiritual part to this. So this is what, what's meant by a spiritual dimension. There are two parts to who you are. One is this outward physical form, and then there's a thing which we call the heart. And the heart is, in Arabic, is you, we use the word qalb, which means the seat of the emotions, the thing that changes. In fact, the word heart in Arabic, qalb, comes from taqallaba, means to turn, because it keeps changing. So this state that you're in, this emotional state, is to do with your heart, your physical element, oh, sorry, your, your spiritual element. And uh, the jism, the, 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 the body, is what it, what it contains, what, is, what it's in, contained in. Right. So that's what, when we say spiritual and cultural, that's what I would describe as the spiritual. Now the cultural, this is where we have a problem because we need to try and split off what's the culture of Islam connected to that spiritual understanding and the culture of the Muslim community. And that's one of the reasons why I think Saika was, was keen for me to speak was because one of the barriers to people understanding or accessing mental health services is because we misunderstand two things, the mental health service and our own religion. And we confuse the cultural aspects of growing up in Pakistan, for example, and what is actually Islam. So what I wanted to do here is just to give you an a, a, a brief overview of what is meant by the culture of, or the Islamic understanding of mental health and in particular anxiety. So the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he mentioned mental health frequently. And he mentioned anxiety very, very specifically. And I think I'll, I'll talk about that in a few minutes. But so this understanding of cultural understanding of, 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 of anxiety and mental health goes all the way back to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. However, it differs in some ways from what we might have perceived um, as a cultural understanding of Islam because for example we know that there's an emphasis in the community on the supernatural and whenever somebody appears to be having some issues or some difficulties in their lives they seem to blame it on the jinn or supernatural powers and we don't deny in Islam that jinn exist However, this is something that is a real barrier to understanding. And the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, actually described mental health and he described anxiety as being things that we need to be aware of. So that goes all the way back to the Prophet وسلم, and how did, this cult, how did it culturally become culturally diverse? It was through the companions and those that followed them and those that followed them. However, that spiritual element of dealing with those emotions, the emotional states of human beings. Go back to the word qalb. Qalb is the place of the emotions. The heart is the place of the emotions. So therefore emotional stability, emotional health was talked about. The heart, the qalb was talked about. However, it was found in lots of what we might call spiritual texts. And they were splattered and di distributed in lots of different other texts. And so there was no simple book which explained this is what mental health is all about. Until we come across a scholar called Abu Zayd al-Balkhi. And this man is a phenomenal character. He's an absolutely a, a phenomenal character. Uh, and when I first read his, the, the book that I'm referring to, Masalih al-Abdan wal-Anfus, I couldn't believe it was written that long ago because the terminology that he was using 
was exactly the kind of terminology that we were using in the mental health movement, for example, which is a, 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 a relatively recent, only 100 years, that people have been using that kind of language. And some of the, the, the words that he would use would only be understood in, in the, the, the paradigm of the, of the cognitive behavioral psychologist. So he's quite phenomenal. He lived at a time, for those people that are interested, uh, of Arazi. And I'll just give you two very quick stories about uh, of what, these, what these two people were like. Arazi is a famous medical scholar, and his, his contribution to, to, to medical science is well known. One of the most interesting things was actually he was one of the people, he was the person who identified the use of stitches, dissolving stitches. The reason, how he did, the reason that this came about was that he liked parties. And one day he invited a group of musicians around to his house and they partied all night. And it got very late and they decided rather than carry all their, their instruments home, they'll just leave them at Arazi's house. So they did. However, Arazi is a scientist and he just happens to have monkeys who he uses for his experiments. And these monkeys decided to eat the strings of the guitars and other instruments. And he says, don't worry, they're going to come out the other end and I'll just observe and I'll track and I'll get them out. And of course they didn't. Why? Because they were dissolved. And then he realized that actually those guitar strings would dissolve. So you could use them for stitching up internal organs. So that was Arazi. Abu Zayd al-Balkhi was the exact opposite. He never went to parties. He was antisocial. He was very he always sat on the outside. He was always a recluse. He himself went through a spiritual crisis at a very early age. He's the ideal person to write about emotional states. So Ar-Razi became a great famous scholar and Al-Balkhi became a forgotten scholar. But his actual work is tremendous, it's enormous. Right, that book I'm just going to talk a little bit about is called Masalih al-Abdan wal Anfus which if you translate it literally, is how to fix the body and the soul. If that's if you were to translate it literally. And it's got two parts. The first top part is, is it's about the simple reminders and advice about how to look after your body. And again, if you listen to it and you read, you, um, you read this book, you'll see it talks about aromatherapy. It talks about the importance of... of going for walks, it's, it, 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 there's a whole section on diet. And then he, after he wrote that part of the book, he said, actually, this is no use to anybody because all it does, it talks about the body. And what we need to do is to talk about how do those things affect the heart? How do those things affect your mental state? And then he decided to write the second half, which is, is really the, the, the really important bit the first bit's kind of interesting from a historic perspective because it describes what medicine was like at the time. And it's also interesting because it talks about some really, at the t what at the time must have been really radical. And because they've been forgotten and we're only finding those things recently, um, uh, the, for example, the effect of, as I say, aromatherapy, certain um, smells on and how they might affect your physical body and your emotional states. That's the first part, but the second part really goes into his observations of himself and other people about their emotional states, their um, spiritual states, and their mental health. Um, he also went on to establish a number of hospitals, and these hospitals were completely holistic. They grew the plants that were used as the medicines. So part of the therapy was actually growing the medicines that you would be taking to. It, it, was, a, it, was, it was all about planning around the needs of the patient in a way that it, it, to think this is 800 years ago is it, it, really quite phenomenal. Um, the book was actually discovered, so to speak, by Dr. Malik Badri or Professor Malik Badri, who translated it as, and the title of it is Sustenance of the Soul, Cognitive Behavioral, Behavior Therapy of a Ninth Century Physician. Uh, and 
obviously he, he, his interpretation is, is in a very modern context and, and the language that he uses is very modern. But if you actually look at the, his, I have cross-checked his translation and it's absolutely superb. And that the wording that he used in most cases um, is, is probably the best, the best way to describe what this, this great scholar had, had done. Right, just to go over some, some of the things that he did talk about, like a whistle-top stop tour of, of the book. Um, he said the body needs to protect, be protected from external harm and internal imbalance. So he talked about this external and internal things that are going on around you. What does this mean for the body? It means that you need to make sure you don't go out in the cold, you don't go out in the extreme heat, that you cover your head, uh, that you, you do all of those things to protect your, your body from the external elements. And likewise, you protect your internal structure, so to speak, by eating healthily. So that's the first part in summary. However, when it comes to the mental, the second part, the mental health part, this is where it really gets interesting. What are the external factors that he, that he, he says there are external factors, then he goes into detail. And you can actually look at them in very clear and apply them very clearly to your own situation and in your support to other people. For example, when you've gone through a crisis, when you've gone through a spiritual, you've gone down a spiritual road that you shouldn't have done, one of the most important things is to not go down that road again, physically. That if you know that a certain place is, is, has associations with haram, for example. And one of the things that I remember telling somebody says, just don't go. When you go to university, just don't go down that road. And he said that was probably the most important thing that I'd ever advised him. Because physically, he was never stimulated, so to speak, externally, to remind him of things that had caused him spiritual and, and, and internal difficulties. So there's a whole series, and that's just a, 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 a I mean, Psycho will go into a lot more detail about, about the kind of things that, that can disturb our, our balance, uh, lead us to imbalance. So there's external things, but there's also internal things. And these are your thoughts. There are thoughts which you need to help you need to help yourself with. And that's where the idea of, as, he, as the, Dr. Dr. Ba Malik Badri said, he was a cognitive therapist. He talked about how to help your thoughts, how to think in a different way. And the most important thing he said is that negative thoughts are the cause of, or the, the root that lead you towards mental ill health. And positive thoughts or dealing with those negative thoughts is the way to get back to balance. And this process is what he describes. Um, and so outwardly, if you know that somebody's gonna make you angry, just don't engage with them. That's the external thing. If you know that um, something's gonna lead, gonna make you, make you sad, then you need to think of how you, how you deal with that. Um, there might be certain types of music you just don't need to listen to. Just stay away from that. And there might be other things that you do need to listen to. Uh, I can remember somebody, and maybe I shouldn't be saying this in public, uh, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, there was a lady that was going through a real crisis, and she'd gone through several um, therapists. She'd been to several scholars, and then eventually she ended up talking to me. We talked and we talked and we talked. And then one day I just told her, you know what you need to do? You need to go to such and such a place. You need to sit on the grass and you need to listen to Bruce Springsteen. She said, what? I thought you were a sheikh. And I said, just do what I told you. So that's what she did. She got a, downloaded a, 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 a song called The River. Uh, she went to a place which happened to be a lake. And she sat on the grass. And she listened to Bruce Springsteen. And she felt better. Now, I'm not saying that you should all go away and listen to Bruce Springsteen. But what I'm saying is that external factors will affect you. And likewise, intel. So that's what Al Balkhi said. So negative thinking leads to the symptoms of disorder. And he, the way that he described the process is really very interesting. But 
we don't have time to go into to, to great detail. So let's go to this idea of curing yourself by your thoughts. And where did this, where did this stand in terms of, your, of, of the Islamic tradition? There was always, from the time of Hassan ibn Thabit, which is in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, a trend in poetry which was about addressing what we say the nafs, talking to yourself, hadith and nafs. And this is something which is, is there in the tradition. I'll give you an example of how that traditional approach can help somebody. I'll give you an example from my own life. There's a poem. It's, it begins with, Ya nafsu in lam tajza'i la Oh soul. If it, the poem begins with, Oh soul, if you don't take care, if you don't do, take some effort, you will never succeed. And then it gives some spiritual advice. And there's one line of the poem which says, It says that if what you request is delayed, perhaps in the delay is everything you wish for. I'll say it again. If the re what you request is delayed, perhaps in what you, in the delay, is everything you wish for. Now, this is a, po a line of poetry that comes back to me over and over again. The first time um, it helped me, so to speak, is that I, um, my ex-wife used to insult me by saying, you're so German, you're so German, because I have German, a German grandmother. But what she meant was that you are just OCD which apparently my, my GP also agreed with. Um, that I do have, I'm a bit obsessive about certain things, and if I say seven o'clock, seven o'clock means seven o'clock, it doesn't mean five to seven, and it doesn't mean five past seven. And that causes a lot of difficulty in the Muslim community, um, because we have what we have, what we call up in a time, flexible time. And I remember my first dars here was at seven o'clock, and there was nobody in the room except the person that I drove with, and I just gave him the class, one student. 30 minutes later, the student started to arrive. But anyway, that's, that's me. How did I start to get over my OCD? Uh, was actually, I traveled with a, from London to Manchester with one of my teachers, who happened to be a Swahili from, from East Africa, from Swahili culture, where you, you, the famous phrase, Hakuna Matata, came, comes from a Swahili. So we got there, headed to the train, and of course, this German OCD guy from is thinking the train is going to leave at 7.16. And he's thinking, the train will leave when Allah sends the train. And I will arrive when I arrive. And of course, you can see there's going to be a problem here. We missed the train. And he's my teacher. And I can't turn around to him and say, I missed the train! which is what my inner soul tells me. He just turns to me, seeing that I'm... He can see the anxiety and the stress on my face because he's one of these spiritual scholars. And he says, the blessing is on the next train. And that was it. The blessing is on the next train. And actually, it all made sense. Life <laughs> began to make sense. You know, you don't need to stress, or I don't need to stress about the train. And if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't have been able to marry Sarah, who's from a Pakistani origin, who kind of works on up and a time. And it works now, because, anyway. So, that poem, If what you want doesn't come, perhaps in the delay is all that you wish for. And it's something that goes, oh, has come over and over again. And one of them is when Sarah, as you know, has had some serious medical challenges in our life recently and I think we've got to a really good place as a result of this I was just in, in Malaysia and I remember talking to someone and I said actually I've never been happier in my life and largely that's because of dealing with Sarah's situation and there was one of the things she said at one point was actually you know if I never get new lungs it's all right I'll be fine like this. And that state is what I was asking for. But we were asking for lungs so she could breathe properly. But actually, we don't need the lungs. 
because we're happy. If you understand. You need to reorganize your thinking. And this is, is from the tradition. So this spiritual poetry is actually deep in, in the Islamic culture. And what, um, what um, Abu Zayd al-Balkhi did is he just explained how it works. And he explained how you use this as part of your therapy. And he started to talk about how to cure yourself and how to cure others. And one of the interesting things he talks about is building a bank of positive thoughts and positive energy. And when I read this, and I says, I've heard that phrase before. And then I went back to look at some of the mental, uh, uh, the, the mental hygiene approach, which is, and I thought, this is exactly what he, what is said in this text, except he said it 800 years earlier. But it, it's phenomenal. Um, um, among, I, I, think, I think there's so much I could have said about that and perhaps on another occasion we might go back to it. But one of the things that he also says, a person should train himself not to overact to the minor incidents or things that he hears or sees. And that's a direct quote from, from a book 800 years old. You know, he, he talked about organ, helping yourself to think correctly and how to prioritize your thoughts and actually this ain't such a big deal and if we could do that we'd actually be reducing anxiety and stress a, a, a great deal anyway quickly what what are we talking about when we say anxiety um, anxiety is a type of fear usually associated for the th uh, with the thought of a threat or something going wrong in the future but can also arise from something happening right now Right, the Arabic word for this, there's two words. There's ham and there's gham. Ham is anxiety about something that hasn't happened. And gham is a concern or a worry, a, a, a mental state about something that has happened. And that's why one of the famous supplications, one of the famous duas is Ya farij al ham wa ya kashif al gham. Ya man li abdihi yaghfir wa yarham. Oh, the one, ya farij alham, the one who removes anxiety. Literally breaks open the anxiety. Farij alham. Wa kashif alham. And the one that um, clears up the concerns related to something that's already happened. I can't translate it into one symbol. Ya man li abdihi yaghfir wa yarham. Oh, you who forgives and shows mercy to his slave. So this dua, this supplication, is, 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 is one which identifies uh, what anxiety is. And I think um, Psyche is a better place to talk in more detail about anxiety, and I'm, I'm sure she will. But anxiety can be something which is beneficial. In fact, it, it generally is something that we need to survive, to, to, be, uh, to be aware of what's going on, in the, what might happen in the future. That's a natural thing. However, it does become a problem when it's either excessive, out of proportion to the demands of the situation, or triggered by everyday non-threatening events. And I apologize for, for, for that definition, or that, because that's what I deal with in my daily life, is that kids have anxiety. All kids have anxiety. But the kids that I deal with, it's excessive. Or it's not relative to what the situation demands, or is triggered by everyday things. And that's where it becomes a problem. If you become anxious because you're missing, you might miss the train. For me, it's not a serious problem, but it could be for other people. When you become anxious about something which is very small, then it becomes something which debilitates you. So that's what we're talking about. Right. And it was mentioned by the Prophet ﷺ in detail. And these three, three hadith that I, I mentioned... Um, when well, I said the Prophet ﷺ spoke specifically about them. مَا يُسِيبُ الْمُسْلِمْ مِنْ نَصَبٍ وَلَا هَمٍ وَلَا حُزْنٍ وَلَا غَمٍ حَتَّى شَوْكَ يُشَاكُهَا إِلَّا كَفْرَ اللَّهِ بِهَا مِنْ خَطَايَاهُ He says a Muslim will not be struck by... I've translated here as difficulty because I translated it three or four weeks ago and I've forgotten what I translated it as and now I've done it here. Perhaps worry would have been 
what might have been the right translation, because it means, it means a difficulty, but in the context it means worry. Um, but both are correct. Wala hammin, we've just talked about anxiety. Wala huznin, and huzn is of two types. And Al Balkhi talks about this several, it, it, there's a large part of his book is about diagnosing what anxiety, what depression is. And he says sadness, there's a sadness which is just normal sadness. People normally feel sad, or not normally, they can feel a normal sadness, sorry. Somebody dies, you feel sad. And then there is a sadness which is excessive or is related to things that are going on inside your physical body. And he often goes, he goes on to explain that some of those things can only be dealt with by dealing with the physical element of that, which is why sometimes, and he describes this, why sometimes medication is required to remove that level of depression or at least stabilize it so you can deal with the other things that might be going on in one's life. But the Prophet ﷺ mentioned it specifically. And then he goes, and there's a reason for this. Every time that you, you have this, this, any of these things happening to you, Allah will release you from that and He will reward you by covering up your mistakes, wiping out your mistakes, whatever way it should be translated. And then um, I'm going to jump because perhaps we, those that are interested can maybe get a copy of the, 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 the slides from somehow. Uh, but the time is quite short. The last one I think is one I wanted to, to talk about is the saying of the phrase la hawla wa la quwwata illa billahi al-ali al is a cure for a hundred illnesses. And I'm going to use the Arabic word adnaha alham. And the word adnaha has several meanings. One is the lowest of which, and the other is the closest of which. So here what he's describing is, is anxiety, is the lowest of the hundred illnesses. It's the lowest of the hundred illnesses, implying that the other illnesses are built upon that. Raised blood pressure, migraines, depression, psychosis, all of those things he describes as being built upon anxiety. What well, adnaha, anxiety is the closest. What it means is every single one of us suffer, well, not suffer, we have anxiety. And some of us suffer as a result of the anxiety and others don't. But it's adnaha, it's every one of us. It's not something that any of us can escape. It's as close to us as habl al warid your own jugular vein. So, so the Prophet ﷺ describes that and he describes that you need to deal with that. And how do you deal with that? He said this phrase. And it's not just simply a matter of the shaykh, the peer, the imam giving you, say this a hundred times and you'll be fine. It will. It's, it's beneficial. But what's more beneficial is to actually understand it. And I'll link it quickly if I have time to... Um, Another supplication, another prayer, another dua that the Prophet ﷺ taught. He said to his, his close um, nephew, sorry, cousin, who he loved dearly. He said to Sayyidina Ali, Ya Ali, do you want me to teach you the prayer for falling into quicksand? By the way, there's not a great deal of quicksand in Medina. And so Sayyidina Ali, Ali said to him, Bala ya Rasulullah, please do. And he says, fi warta. If you fall into quicksand, Qul, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, Wala hawla, wala quwwata illa billahi al And this one I'll translate. In the name of God, name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. There is no power, there is no ability other than from Allah. What's that got to do with quicksand? Let me explain. What is quicksand? Quicksand is mud that if you move, you sink further. So how do you get out of quicksand? You don't move. 
you stay still. You submit to the situation you're in and you cope. And one of the ways you cope is through this supplication. You recognize that actually I believe in God. I believe in the name of Allah who is most merciful and most gracious, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. And there is no power to get me out of here other than through his power. And you wait until somebody comes and throws you a lifeline and pulls you out. And you don't know who that's going to be. You don't know who that is going to be. But ultimately, it's going to be sent by the one that you believe in. So he taught us how to get out of quicksand. And I'm pretty certain that he wasn't talking about quicksand alone. Because I've never been in quicksand. But this supplication has got me out of my quicksand. My spiritual quicksand. My mental quicksand. My difficulties. My concerns. My anxieties. My worries. All of those things. It's helped me. Because it empowered me to actually recognize I can't do this. I can't get out of this mess on my own. I need a means. And the means isn't me. I need to wait for somebody to come and give me that help. Or I need to find and look around. And hopefully, through supplication, through this, I will get there. Okay. Um, Right, there was another supplication, but I think, which actually talks about where the Prophet says, Allah inni a'undu bika min al-hammi wal Oh Allah, I ask for protection with you from anxiety and from depression, and being overwhelmed by debt. <laughs> Three things so far. Depression, anxiety, and debt. And the fourth one, وَقَحْرُ rijal. And if I was speaking at uh, one of our feminist rallies, I would have said, translated literally, the overpowering of men. But I don't think it's, uh, uh, that's what it means. It means bullying. It means where people, human beings, are pressurizing me. And kahr, kahr means to overwhelm. So this supplication mentions four things. And I can't think of any more modern interpretation than that. Debt, anxiety, Bullying, and what was the last one? Depression. Amin. Say Amin. Okay, let's go on a little bit further. So Balqi's approach to anxiety, we believe that the core of all harmful emotional symptoms lies in distress or anxiety. That's an actual direct quote of what he said. All the other illnesses, and he bases it on the hadith, come as a result of anxiety. It's a starting point of all symptoms and their, aug and their augmenter. So if we can deal with anxiety, well, we'll actually be reducing the, the mental health issues that we have in our community. And that's why this is such an important event. Um, so, I've got a few questions. I don't expect any answers, but I'm going to throw them up anyway. So, is there a clash of cultures involved in dealing with anxiety in a modern context? If there is, the clash of culture is based on a misunderstanding of Islam. Because if you just listen to what I've said, you'll see that actually the prophetic understanding has no problem with anything that Psyche is going to be introducing us to in a few minutes. And if, if it had, I wouldn't have uh, been so happy to stand on the same platform with her. Islam recommends that we seek a means, asbab. Asbab means that even though we believe in God and we believe that God will help us, I'll give you the best example that I know of is the Battle of Badr. We all know about the Great Battle of Badr. The Prophet ﷺ was promised victory. And it looked as if it was impossible to get victory. Why? Because they were 313 men and the, the army was 1,000 plus. The other army had horses, they had camels, they had archers, they had weapons, they had swords. The Muslims had nothing. Well, they didn't. They had 11 swords, actually. 11 swords between 313 soldiers it's not a great, great number. Most of the others had to use sticks and stones. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, he picked up a piece of grass and he says, I will fight them with this. Why did he pick up a piece of grass even though they were promised victory? The reason was, was because he was teaching us that even though you believe, even though that you believe 
that there is a cure and there's a means out there, you still need to make the effort to find that means. And you need the means to get to, the, to, the, to, the, to, to what has been promised to you. So you will get healthy. Inshallah, the dua will be answered. But you also need to use a means. And your piece of grass, it might be going to the GP. It might be taking medication. It might be going to a therapist. It might just be chatting with people. It might even be going down to the river and listening to Bruce, Bruce Springsteen. But you do need to do something. So there's no clash there. And as therapists become more and more skilled in dealing with cultural nuances, and they become more culturally sensitive, you will see that anybody that goes to a good therapist, to a good practitioner, they will find that they will understand them as individuals with all of the cultural background and the religious and sen and that's what you know we, we have to work together and finally that when it does work culturally competent approaches to health without a doubt are the most effective so i don't see that as a being a clash so thank you very much and two minutes before time uh inshallah see I'm still Germanic. <laughs> <laughs>